So, <coughs> uh, so you've seen how to build a, a web application, obviously, with this thing. So, so you run the script, and it out of the box gives you like a Hello World style web application that you know that even looks you know, mildly pretty. And so, this is of course something that uh, that there are a million frameworks to do, and um, you may well have done something similar in, in another course. Um, so generally, when, when you write a web application, the, and the reason it's no fun is that every web application has this client-server architecture that the user perceives stuff in the browser, and uh, then you have to rig it so that some buttons get clicked in the browser that sends a request to the web server uh, using HTTP. You can then transfer information to the server um, either that's encoded just in the request uh, URL or you can post some form data. Then uh, the, the server needs to do whatever computation it needs to do. It then needs to render the HTML to make the answer look uh, presentable to the user. And so just like with any user interface application, you have this inversion of control that instead of your application being able to ask the user for information and then uh, give the results, the application just sits there and does nothing most of the time. But once in a while, it says, hey, deal with this. And so your application is chopped into bits and pieces of flow, and it's difficult to program these things. So <clears throat> um, no one loves doing a web applications for, for this reason. And so there's this, this large number of toolkits that was produced to, to write them. And so typically, a web application framework will try to help you in all sorts of different things. Like one of the painful things is just to render the HTML. That if you render the HTML from scratch, it's a lot of work, even if you can do some styling. So one of the approaches that is popular if you've ever done something with JSF or GWT or ASP.NET is those libraries try to give you the illusion that a web application is just like a swing application, that you can put components onto the page, that components have rich behavior, and that you can wire them together. Um, has anyone ever done any JSF or ASP.NET? Um, so as, as someone who does, I can tell you that the illusion does not hold up very well in practice, that it's very difficult to do web components that act like client-side components. And so they, they tend not to do a, a super great job. And uh, so these days, that's become less popular. Um, the <coughs> Other thing that you can do is you can use templates, and that's something that you've seen in PHP or in Ruby on Rails, where there's some mechanism that lets you write some HTML code, that lets you do loops and decisions and that kind of things in uh, uh, some programming language, PHP or Ruby, or in the case that we're going to be seeing here, Scala, and that generates some HTML by executing that, that code. Um, and that's that's simpler and it's good enough for many applications. The third thing that I should put on there is that nowadays, of course, many web applications are uh, do a lot of work on the client side where you have a whole client written in JavaScript and it then uh, talks in the back end with the server. And so then the HTML generation is done by a client side framework. So uh, the client sends requests to, to the server and the server needs to figure out what to do with them. And that's something where typically a web framework will give you some amount of assistance with routing, where it does things such as taking the request parameters that come in a, in a very primitive data structure and put them into uh, something that's more domain specific. Um, <clears throat> another thing that they try to help you with is, is database persistence. Um, you, typically a web application will need to store data in some way. And so they, they usually is some way of communicating with a database through something that's higher level than raw SQL. Um, and that again depends from one framework to, uh, to another. You typically have some kind of OR mapping. Like in Ruby and Rails, you'll have active record. Um, in uh, Java EE, you have uh, uh, <coughs> the Java persistence architecture and so on. Um, 
then there's usually some mechanism that helps you factoring out repetitive code. Web applications you know, suffer from that in uh, that you know, just to generate you know, visual effects, for example. Um, and then there are these other things that any application framework uh, has to deal with, such as internationalization and security. So the, the hope is that one shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel of, the, uh, of, of those aspects uh, yourself, and the framework should take care of that. So no matter what language you use, you have a wide variety of uh, choices for these frameworks, and uh, <coughs> uh, they've come in and out of popularity. So the, the classic idea of, this, of, of frameworks really was JS, JSF and ASP.NET. They, they wanted to leverage programmers' experience in Swing. Uh, Swing programmers, uh, you know, they understand how to take components, to wire them together. Um, components fire events. Uh, these events tr trigger changes elsewhere in the user interface. And so if you look at JSF, for example, they, they try to reimagine that entire infrastructure on, uh, on the web, and it, uh, it has one very nice aspect, and that is that as a JSF programmer or as an ASP.NET programmer, the, you can pretty much separate the, the markup, the, the visual appearance from the behavior. Um, it has several disadvantages. One is it fits poorly into the web because it's very stateful. So the, uh, one always has to remember what the state of the, of the various components is. The state sense seems, seems to be large, so you have to put it into session state, and so it's, it, you have scalability issues. Um, and the other problem that it has is more fundamental is that it doesn't really work. Um, that uh, it's, it does, does not scale up. I've done a whole bunch of JSF programming, and the illusion <coughs> that these things are just like client-side components lasts until the very moment that your application starts getting interesting and complicated. And at that point, it completely falls apart, and you have to really understand how that illusion was created to work with it and not against it. So, uh, so for, for very simple web applications, they work, but otherwise, it's, uh, it is, is somewhat painful. And it's sad, because it seemed like such a nice promise before um, that you could take the skills that you have from client-side UIs and work them on the server. So um, people got disillusioned with, uh, with uh, those kinds of things. And uh, then the appeal of, of uh, what's called the restful style of applications uh, started. It said, you know, you really should not be having a lot of server-side state. You shouldn't be having <coughs> um, these, these uh, large, hard-to-test applications. Instead, you should think about that your application you know, could live on the server, could live on a JavaScript client, and it communicates with the backend of the server through you know, what the web was meant to be. And the web was meant to do gets and posts and maybe puts and deletes. That's what the, uh, what the HTTP pr protocol was there. You should live with the protocol. You should avoid uh, server-side state whenever you can. And uh, <coughs> th that way your application automatically scales horizontally just because it, it follows the web architecture instead of you know, uh, just sitting on top of it. So that was one of the trends that, that's moved away from the classic uh, frameworks. And the other one was the classic frameworks tended to have a very large amount of configuration. So uh, has anyone ever worked with Java EE? So the old Java EE, so up to before Java EE 5, you had to write a huge amount of XML files just to get going. It was really terrible. Um, I don't think I've ever successfully deployed an, a Java EE application before. It's fine. And then they, uh, they took a, uh, away a lot of that. But that was only when other frameworks started eating their lunch. And so particularly Ruby on Rails uh, came along and it's this very opinionated framework that said that in, <coughs> instead of making the programmer define absolutely everything, the framework just says, uh, establishes certain conventions, and as long as you follow those conventions, you don't have to do any configuration at all. And so uh, we'll see play follows the same idea. And that really is, is an idea that I think has, has taken hold uh, in, in general, and you wouldn't want to have it any other way. The other thing that throws a wrinkle into the traditional web application uh, framework model is AJAX. So nowadays, it's much more common 
to have longer lived connections to the server where the, the client is written in JavaScript. It could be a single page client that just you know, rebuilds its DOM tree on demand and it communicates with the server ov over an AJAX channel that stays alive. And again, so the server you know, has, has to be able to, to react to these commands, but if you wanted to do that by hand, that's also a real pain. So you wanna have support for that from, from your framework. So, um, so Play is a framework that uh, <coughs> was uh, developed originally uh, out of discontent with uh, the other frameworks that exist for Java that, that were quite heavyweight and you know, it's what Play meant, is meant to be playful and uh, it was interestingly enough, so they started writing it in Scala and this went through several iterations, then they made a Java version so that you didn't have to know Scala to, to use it. But it, it, we know Scala and the, it's much more pleasant to use it in Scala than in Java, so of course we want to do that. Um, Play is interesting in that it is uh, quite type safe and you'll see that later in the lab when you make an error in, for example, the routing. That error is found at compile time. And that is super nice because if you've ever done anything, for example, with Java EE, and if you make an error somewhere in one of the configuration files, like you're mapping some beans to some pages or something, and you misspell the name of one of the beans, then that is not at all detected at compile time. In fact, it's not really detected anywhere except something goes wrong at runtime, and then what happens? I wish. Then you get an error 404, and then with no indication what goes wrong. It just basically says, you're not having a good day. And then you have to look into the, the logs. And in the logs, you find the stack trace from hell that is this long. And somewhere around level 60, you'll find maybe, if in fact it is not entirely your bad day, you'll find some indication of what you did wrong. So for some reason, that particularly in Java EE, um, the application server thinks that its job is to only deal in a programmer-friendly way when your application is completely error-free. If there's any error at all, you know, that was your fault after all, Mr. or Mrs. Programmer, and so you better deal with it. The application server is much too busy to help you out. And so it's, it's very time-consuming to debug applications uh, in, in that kind of environment. And so the play people said, that's no fun. And so they tried to make it so that whenever there is something that you know, is your typical kind of typo, that they try to detect all of that at deployment time. And that really uh, makes, is, is much more developer friendly. So uh, Play does, uh, makes it actually genuinely hard to use server-side state. So, so serv when I say server-side state, what I mean with that is, so typically when you have a, an, an application, a web application that that remembers what you did. So let's say you have a shopping cart or something. That um, you know somewhere one does need to remember what your shopping cart was. And so if it was isn't already stored in the database, then you know they would just serialize the entire cart, put it somewhere on uh, on the server. And next time you reconnect because you want to add one more thing to it, they would find that data structure on the server uh, and give it back to the next request and have you work with it. The trouble with that is that it means that the next reconnect has to be to the same server because that's the server that held your session state or the session state has to be shared among servers and it doesn't scale well because what if now another 10,000 shoppers come on there and uh, they overload a uh, server. Then you, um, what, what a Java E application has to do, they have to say, oh my God, now the server is getting overcommitted, so we're going to have to replicate it somewhere else. We're going to have to export all the session state to some of the other server. It's a very costly operation. And so it's much, much better if your servers are stateless because then generating new ones and forming requests to others is, is easy. Then there's no need to, to, uh, to keep affinity to the server. So the play framework says you know, that's generally how you should architect your applications and they make that, they make that part easy. Um, another thing is that generally um, on a traditional server, um, the they implemented that um, <coughs> they run some number of threads. Each thread can uh, deal with uh, with one request. 
And so then the, the number of requests is limited by the number of concurrent threads that you run on the server. Um, that architecture um, was fine 20 years ago, but uh, nowadays um, you're actually much better off with what's called non-blocking architecture where you have a single thread that deals with the incoming requests, farms then off to, to, to something else that does the work, and uh, then asynchronously uh, gets the results back. So the play framework supports uh, that. It is, as you'll see, a system with con convention over configuration. And generally, it's been built to be programmer friendly. So it, it, uh, <coughs> uh, it gives you good error messages. It's get, it gives you what's called hot deployment out of the box. So that means when you change the source code, the application on the server changes right away. Um, with uh, Java E server, that's a bit hit and miss. Um, hot deployment has gotten much better than it used to be. In the olden days, it was quite bad. Every time that you made a change, you had to redeploy the application that took you know, se several seconds or half a minute even if the application was large. And in that time, of course, you lost all your concentration as a programmer. And so it, it was bad. So, um, so the play framework you know, does, does that automatically. Um, as it happens, the play framework is agnostic to the data store. Um, you can use, as we'll see in the first uh, lab, you can use a very simple um, a SQL wrapper, you, or you could use, as, as we'll uh, see in the next lecture after the exam, um, you can use a, <coughs> uh, an, an OR mapper, or you could just say no to SQL altogether and uh, use a no SQL system, which I don't think we're going to be seeing in this class. But that's, um, that's not something that they're hugely concerned about with. Although, as you'll see in the lab, it does a pretty nice job with, with integrating with uh, with at least a couple of uh, database interfaces. So a little bit of vocabulary now that you've seen the first applications here. So when we look at our application here, so you've seen there is a, a, a few important things. You see a d differentiation between controllers and views. And this is something that you generally see in web frameworks. So a, uh, a view is something that produces a visual artifact, that produces the web page. Um, a controller is something that takes care of an incoming request and figures out what to do with it. So if we look at here the application, it gives a method that we call, that's called index here. And um, it says what index should, should, should do. So <coughs> Um, here I have another message called hello and an action is something that takes an HTTP request and turns it into some kind of an HTTP response so in this case here it's an OK and then there is an HTML text here that, sh that should be rendered in this case it's just a, a plain text um, but in general it'll be HTML so <coughs> um, in general, um, a controller is a class that has a bunch of methods. Each of those give you these actions. Um, one nice little thing is the, there's a special action called to do. And when that action gets executed, it gives you like a purple screen that says not yet implemented. So you'll see it in, in, in the lab. And so you're encouraged to already write all the methods that, that you need. That way, your routers that you'll see in the next slide will compile. and uh, but then it's clear during testing what happens. So also notice that um, it's a pretty nice uh, set of methods that if you understand HTTP, then you're familiar with codes like OK, uh, the usual 400 OK, or the, uh, the 404 not found. And then the names of these methods are, they just follow those that, that you're familiar with, with the standard. So. <coughs> You put the controller into, into this application class, and then, then you're off to go. So <clears throat> in terms of asynchronous processing, so let's look into that. Um, uh, so all of the requests that come in are executed off a single thread. Um, this is also something that um, if uh, you've heard about Node.js, you know, which is all the rage these days, um, it does the same thing. And 
So the reason, uh, again, is um, just, just a question of efficiency, that at some point, thread creation and management gets surprisingly expensive. And uh, so it, it's just not a bad idea, provided, of course, that uh, when, when, when you're doing any work at all, that work needs to be extremely short-lived. So if, if you were to do any lengthy amount of work, you would be blocking everyone else from having even access to the web server. So you have to have iron discipline or a framework that enforces this automatically to make sure that uh, you do absolutely no inessential work on, on the event thread. Um, I don't know enough about Node to know what it does to enforce that. Um, maybe nothing. Um, but uh, the, the way it works in, uh, <coughs> Uh, in, uh, in play is what you're supposed to do is every time that you have any amount of work that takes time, then you, s then you should, instead of using a play node action, you know, which is deemed to be you know, instantly you know, short-lived and, and uh, instantly finished, you're supposed to do an action.async. So action.async is, is a wrapper that then gets executed asynchronously. And at that point, then you're supposed to do some asynchronous computation. So you have a method that computes pi, you know, to whatever million, a million digits, and it does it asynchronously. And <coughs> I'm, uh, and then what it does is, well, this thing returns what, what's called a future. So that <coughs> uh, a future is is a wrapper. Um, you can kind of think of it maybe as an equivalent, or maybe not. Um, you, you're familiar with the option wrapper. So the option wrapper says something is present or not. The future is, is, is maybe syntactically similar, but it's something that will be available eventually. So, um, <coughs> and when it finally is available, then you can process this in some way. So just uh, as with an option, oh, I, I didn't put, I should have put it as a for loop here because we, know, we now know how to use this with a the, with the for, um, but here I used a map. So when the thing is available, finally, then this code will be executed. The okay response will be generated and it will then be delivered to the client and all of that will happen on a different thread. So the, the, uh, the thread that got the response has long served 10,000 other requests the client doesn't know anything about that, but now the client is going to get the answer back from the th some thread, we don't care where it comes from, that, uh, that gets woken up when comp compute pi async is finally finished. So the play framework makes this kind of uh, threading very simple by giving you a few primitives for this, and you don't really have to think about the threading very much, as long as you follow one simple rule, and that is never to do any long running work on the event thread. That's something that uh, if you've ever done client user interfaces or like a telephone user interface, it's the same thing. Um, yeah? What is the difference with, uh, instead of compute by async dot map where it's okay, if it's um, okay, compute by async? Oh, that, that would not work because, um, the, well, what would happen? I'm sure it would work, but I don't know what would then happen. Um, it, the, the call to OK would then block. Until it, it returns, whereas this one here would first call this. So I don't actually know what dot async does. <laughs> so all I know is that what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, whenever you call a long running function, you're then supposed to, to uh, it gives you, if, oh no, you know what, I know what happens. Um, I'm, I'm, I was wrong. So compute pi async returns a future. Okay, will not even accept a future. So I guess what you could have written is you could have written okay of compute pi async dot get or whatever the thing is to get something out of a future. And the difficulty with that is, and the reason that they're not putting that in the code is, what if it didn't return successfully? So if, if you do it in this style, there's, there's actually a way with the future of saying, if it returns successfully, do this, otherwise do something. Callback. What's that? Callback. Yeah, so either way you give a callback. 
on success or on failure. That, that's also a way of giving a callback. This is a way of giving a callback because this the dot map is called when this future has returned successful. And it's called dot map for just a general because there is some structural similarity between maps on collections and, and maps on futures and on, on options. So I could, instead of use the using dot map, I could have said, uh, I could have used the for, <coughs> let me write down. I could have said for x in compute pi asynchronously yield OK of x. That would have been the same. But then, like, that, that looks like you could have multiple x's. Would you do an OK response for every one of them? Well, what you, you could actually use this, um, this style if, if you wanted to chain several of them. And it would then chain them and eventually give you one back. But that's really because what it is is it translates the four into sequences of maps, right, or maps and flat maps. Yeah, but I mean like. So so let's say you have you you have two hardworking functions. So you could say for x goes to um, f y g of x yield OK of Y. And so this would call X, F. When the answer is ready, then it would call G. And when that answer is ready, then it would uh, yield the, the flat result. Yeah, but what I meant is that this mutation makes me feel like there could be multiple yields. No, you can't have multiple yields. Ah, then it's only one yield. So the four yield is syntactic sugar for, uh, for calling the maps and flat. And so the map just means wait until the answer is ready and then feed it to the next stage. So, so the point is that um, whenever you need to do something that's longer running, you're supposed to use these async things. Um, so <coughs> um, routing, so there's a file called confroutes that you've detected here in, in the starter application. And you can kind of see the syntax here. First of all, you notice that this is some other language. This is not Java and not Scala. Um, and um, the, the way it works is that here you have the HTTP verb. That would be get or uh, a post or put or delete. Um, and then here you have something that describes the request. And then you map it to a controller. So here we had a very simple one. If the request is tasks all, then here it goes to controllers.tasks.list, which is some method. And it just calls the method, and uh, then that method will compute the answer in some way. Here we have a find. And because back here I have an ID parameter, so the second half is Scala code. It's a code of a Scala method. Then it knows that there must be an ID query parameter. So the, there must be like tasks ID find question mark ID equals. You could also, if you for some reason don't like query parameters, you could use this form with a dynamic part. And then if one makes a request, say, for slash task slash 1,000, then it finds it that way. And then here you again have to map it in this case here. In this case here, you, know, you do need to put the ID here. Um, and you can have multiple ones. You can have slash ID, slash, slash, whatever. And um, then you just list the parameters that you want to have passed here. Then finally, when you do like a multi-part match here, the star file means that um, whatever comes afterward can have as many slashes as you want. You want to get the whole thing inside this variable here. And then you get it as a string. You can also have other parameters here. We have a parameter with a default. So if you wanted to override the default, then the request would have to say question mark path equals. And then one could put some other path here. So these routes are compiled into some code. And we don't really care what that code is. <clears throat> but the advantage of them being compiled is that 
if you have either a syntax error in the route or if one of the methods back here doesn't exist or there's an, uh, there's an issue with parameter types, then you get those messages uh, right away. So then the other thing that's, that you've noticed when you look at the sample application here is these funky looking templates. So these have extension .scala.html and they are some mixture of Scala and uh, text in uh, yet another different template language um, that's gratuitously different from the other template languages that, that you've seen so far. So this is, <coughs> this is a general purpose engine that doesn't strictly have to deal with web applications. It could, could deal with any mixture of strings and, uh, and Scala called Twirl. Um, and we're not going to learn all of the rules, but here's the basics. That instead of using the dollar that you've seen so far, it uses the at sign um, for <coughs> anything that's Scala specific. So over here, you see at dot run, and then followed by some Scala code. Over here, you see at followed by a Scala variable. So I'll give you a few of the rules so that you can decipher these things. So you generally use at for injecting Scala expressions. Oops. So let's see what we have here. We have a UL, it's an unordered list. <coughs> That's text, the matching backslash, backslash oh, sorry, uh, slash UL here as well. Then we have an at, then we have a Scala expression. And so we iterate over some collection of tasks. And for each of them, we now generate more text. So just like when we did the XML thing, you see this mixture of uh, XML, Scala, and then XML again. Oops. And then over here you have more Scala, and then it generates the result of the Scala code. And it reads pretty nicely. So it, uh, it reads almost exactly like what you've seen for the embedded XML and Scala uh, in, in the XML lecture. Um, I can never figure out how it knows when the Scala ends and when the non-Scala begins. Uh, but it does seem to know, and so I, you know, if, if I used it more, I would, I would worry. But right now, it seemed to know just fine. <clears throat> Notice that the first line of each of these things is different. It's somehow special. So it starts with an at, and then it starts with parameters. So here we have a queried function that first takes a title and then some HTML. That seems to be coming out of nowhere. And so this thing is some kind of a template. When you look at this thing here, this, this particular thing is a wrapper that puts like style sheet links and a script link here, and then it puts the, the HTML content in here. So this thing is just generated to make it easier for you to make pages that contain this, uh, this stuff. Um, if you've seen any kind of template engines, uh, you've seen, uh, like for example, in, in the world of uh, <coughs> Java applications, there's a thing called tiles that works the same way that gives you, that it gives you pre-canned snippets of frames and menus and the kinds of things that always look the same around and tells you where to, where to customize them. So here the customization point is we want to inject the content inside here. And notice here that to find the exact location of where uh, this particular asset, this, this JavaScript is, it, it, it also has a little bit of customization code. This one here, well, this I just modified it, so let me go back to what it was. Uh, if I could. <clears throat> so play 20.welcome is some function that's predefined that takes a message and wraps it into some pretty uh, pretty wrapper. And so here again you see this this page here has a parameter that's the message. Then it calls the main thing as its title, it gives it welcome to play. And as its second parameter, that's the HTML, it gives us this thing. So it's curried to make this thing kind of easy. So that's this particular template language. Um, now, truth be told, these days, you know, who, who still writes HTML on the server, you're much more likely to do it on the client, and then you wouldn't even see this part. But hey, it's, it's there. So there's an API for forms. And again, you know, given that these days one often does, does this stuff on the client, it's uh, it's not super interesting to, 
to see it, but it's simple enough that we can spend spend a couple of minutes with it. You'll need it for the for the next lab. So, <coughs> um, the one of the problems that it tries to solve, and reasonably so, is that when you have an HTML form, then what you get out of it is a a hash table from names to values. When you write an application, you would like to deal with with higher level objects. Uh, you know, maybe if, if you process users, you might want to have a user object. When you have a shopping cart, you might want to have item objects and so on. And it's boring to have to, to always to deal with hash tables. If you wanted to always program with hash tables, you'd do your work in PHP. So um, <coughs> they give you a kind of easy way of translating between form data and uh, application level uh, classes. So by default, when, when you make a form, you, <coughs> you, uh, uh, you can, no, I shouldn't say by default. So there's several strategies you can use. One of the strategies that's it's kind of trivial is the tuple strategy where you say, I just want to have a tuple of first of the name and then of the age. And so then your application program would deal with tuples instead of maps, you know, which doesn't seem like a great advantage. More interestingly is you can use the mapping strategy to translate form data to application data. And then you have to give two, two methods, uh, one to turn form data to an application object and one to go the other way around. And the, these mappings are cleverly selected so that when you have a case class that you can just give it apply and unapply. And that would be even more clever if it would automatically make use of apply and unapply when you use a case class, but for some reason they don't do that. So um, what you should reasonably, what you can reasonably do um, with a lot of form data is you can just make one case class for what you collect in the form, or you can have more than one, and then you don't have to work harder on these mappings yet. But that way, it gives you a nice way of translating between the form data and your application level objects. There's all sorts of other things you can do. You can automatically add, cons you can add constraints right here. And then when the user makes an input error, let's say they give you an, an age that's negative, then the error handling can be done automatically. Then the, you know, the little X can appear at the right spot. And the framework takes care of niceties like that. So if you need to do form handling, that, that stuff is quite nice. And uh, uh, <coughs> that's, so it takes, away, uh, t it takes care of, of a common kind of drudgery in web applications. There's, some, there's a bunch of helpers that, uh, that will help you out, and you'll get to appreciate them in the lab. Um, you need to import them in this way in the template. And like here is a typical form. So we're telling it um, that we want to have a submit button in here. For some reason, that one does not get automatically put in. And we want when the submit button gets hit, we want it to automatically go to this task here, so sorry, to this, to this method, the delete task, and we want it to give it the task ID. Somehow then it knows to also put in an input field for the ID. I don't remember why. Um, there is one, Nifty thing here, uh, hang on. So, so this is something that, so where's delete task come from? That is, no, sorry, let me, see. okay, now I know what I want to say. So, um, so this delete task here um, is a function. It's a function uh, that you have put into the application object and you're telling the form what function you want to have called. That's not how a web application actually works. The way a web application works is that when you click on a button, some URL gets reached. Now, which URL? And so this is a service that Play provides. It figures that out for you from the routes map. So it inverts the routes map and looks up the URL for you. Then it generates the correct HTML for the submit button so that that one gets, uh, uh, gets put in. Um, I should actually have put that in the lab. Maybe I'll remember to put that in. To, that you inspect the HTML 
and you witness that. So this reverse routing is kind of nice, um, and it also means that <coughs> it, it minimizes a, a kind of error. It's common for, for programmers to put in the, 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 the wrong thing in there. Also, it means when you move your application, when you make changes to the routing, that you don't have to update all of the, uh, the pages. So then there's a convenience, uh, then the convenience functions for generating input element. Um, so when you say input text, it makes an input text element. And there, the reason that they use these convenient functions is when you use error handling, it needs to know where those elements are so that it can put in the, like the, the error messages next to the right positions and stuff. And finally, when you're done with your form object, then you can, uh, you need to pass it to the page. You do that by adding it as a parameter to the page. Um, so pages can have any number of parameters and typically you put in both your user data and your form objects and then when you render the page, you, you render the forms using the user data in some way. You'll see that in the lab. Finally, <coughs> persistence. So for this lab, I've used a thing called a norm, um, just because it's there and it's pretty well supported. So, so the general idea is that um, nowadays uh, a lot of people like to use an object relational mapper, something that lets the developer think in terms of, of objects and where the database is kind of secondary. So for example, if you think of what an invoice is, you know, from a developer's perspective, an invoice is something that has you know, a mailing address, a billing address, and a shipping address, and a list of, or, of uh, line items, and each line item has an order number, and a price, and a discount, and whatever. So <clears throat> you know how to model that in, in Scala or in any other object-oriented language. Then when, you, when it comes to SQL, then you have to say, oh my god, now this is a complicated thing. I need a table for the invoices. I need a table for addresses and a foreign key and I need a table for line items, and it's a many-to-many -many relationship, and then to take an invoice object and to store it or to get it back, um, there is an afternoon of, of back-breaking labor. Um, so the idea of the ORM is to say this is actually completely routine work, and it should be an easy job to take the, <coughs> the object-oriented description and turn it into a relational description and the other way around. And for easy cases, that works just fine. Um, if you're in a situation where you say, I don't give a care what the database looks like, you can write your objects, your classes first, and say, I just want the, o the OR mapper to map them automatically. And it works beautifully. Every time I tell that to anyone who does anything with databases, they're totally horrified, so I'm glad that my colleague is not here. Um, because the problem with that approach is that databases are very long-lived. And so now, what if you have a change in your object model? then you would have to change your database. And the, o o the OR mapping people say, yeah, so whatever. And you know, just write a migration script and uh, it'll migrate your database into the new compatible schema. But uh, and it, <coughs> it's, it is an issue. And, and also, there's always people who say, well, gosh, I could write the most important queries as stored procedures so that they run you know, twice as fast as if you did them. By, by putting in a, a prepared statement. And that's, of course, also true. And you know, twice as fast as nothing to, to sneeze at. Maybe they can do it faster. What do I know? So some people really like to say the database comes first. And uh, it's important that the database is there. It's fast. It's consistent. Everything, all the work is done in uh, stored procedures. And the application programmer has to suffer and has to do the, the encoding and decoding. So, uh, so the A norm people are more on, on that end, that they say, you want to talk to the database, you use SQL. Um, now, personally, I'm not really ever doing that, but what, what do you know? That's, we're going to do it for this lab because it's simple. Enough. So then, you know, writing SQL is hard and boring. So they said, well, um, we can't solve the hard and boring problem for you, so instead we'll solve an easy problem for you. And so they make it somewhat easier to, to generate SQL statements. So here is what you can do. You say, give me an SQL statement. And 
Now th they give you a slightly different query lang uh, language. So they say uh, you can write a query like this, in insert into a task, and then I guess this is, I don't even know what this is. Um, I don't have a clue what this thing is. I, I just copied this. So let's figure this out. So insert into task is clear, right? Values, and then we have a sequence of values. On, aha. All right, so here's the syntax. This thing is a parameter variable. This thing over here is the value of that parameter. This thing over here is a map key which corresponds to this parameter variable. And this thing over here is the value of a Scala. Uh, this is the Scala variable that was called Leo. And so I don't exactly know why this is any easier than just writing these query by hand, but, uh, or just using a prepared statement. But that's, that's, the, that's the thing that, that a norm gives us. Um, the reason that I'm, that I'm using a norm is not that, uh, but as you'll see when you run the lab is that it does, it's uh, <coughs> play is hardwired to take advantage of uh, some basic infrastructure and, and run micro creation and migration scripts for you. And so to do all of this, and this is actually, that is kind of nice, is when you do any programming with uh, JDBC, you know that uh, in order to talk to the database, you need to have a connection. And then you can ask the connection to create a prepared statement thing. And then you need to have the prepared statement. And then you make, then you give a query, and then you get a result set, and then you get something out of the result. And um, that's all fine, except what do you have to do with them? Did anyone do any JDBC programming? What is the biggest pain in the ass of JDBC? Yeah, you have to do the try cache, and you have to close everything. Because if you don't close everything, it is remarkable how quickly you will run out of uh, database resources. Um, so it's a, it's a very easy matter to shoot yourself in the foot with JDBC uh, by not closing a connection in a web request. And after 50 customers or so, all your database connections have been used up. And uh, so it's something that as a student, you don't really notice. But as an intern, you'll start to notice very quickly. And so it's, it's a stupid pain. So they take care of that kind of stuff. They, say <coughs> they will give you the connection. And interestingly enough, they will give it to you using the Scala implicit mechanism that we briefly talked about when? When did we talk about implicit? What was that? Yeah, where was that? Um, that we had a specific use case where we did implicit. Something came in implicitly, and I can't even remember. Huh. Okay, it'll. It wasn't XML. What, what, what? Okay, I can't remember. There was one lab where. So, what was that? Oh, the ordering. Exactly. Exactly. With the types. Yes, yes. So, um, where you, know, you were using some particular type, and so you could implicitly say, I want to use the correct ordering for this type. And so here's the same kind of thing. So you, you can implicitly summon and say, I need a connection. And it comes. And so that's kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> and so they do a good job with that. Okay, so I'm giving a norm a bad rap here. It does do one other kind of nice thing. It parses the result set. So when you do a select star from task, then you get back a sequence of rows. And if you do this with JDBC, then you have to fiddle them apart. And each row has, uh, is essentially a hash table. And <clears throat> uh, then you have to take that thing and, uh, and cook an object out of it. And so a norm gives you a kind of clever way of doing that, that'll look familiar to you because it looks just like the parser combinators that we had. So here is a way uh, of parsing a task, for example. We say, get me the long thing, that's an ID, and get me the string thing, that's the label. And then when you have that, then return, to that, return me a Scala object with that ID and label. Now, you would think that there would actually be an easier way of, of doing this, but that's, that's how, this, how the syntax works. And so you'll notice the squiggle here. That is exactly how the parser combinators work. So 
this is a thing that <coughs> uh, that that matches an ID followed by a label with with these types here. Uh, with the parser combinators, instead of map, we use the hat hat, but it was the same thing. It's followed by a piece of code that then gives some value. That's the value that we want. And so here, the syntax that you'll want to use if you want to do that for a uh, for a select that, of course, gives you a set of rows, is um, you use this this query here, and then you use ask, and then task is a parser for one row, task star is a parser for uh, parser for a sequence of rows, exactly like the what was it called? It was called rep when we used this for uh, for the grammar parsers. And so here they used the symbol star for rep, you know, which is also reasonable. What's the type of task to use a partially applied function? Uh, no. Um, what is... Well, it's a vowel, um, but... Uh, It's a function. Why? Why is it partially applied? Uh, it's, just, just, just function. it's just a function. It's a it's um, it's a function that can consume you know something. Uh, so the type of this function here is it'll consume a row. I guess um, this, there must be some some type of rows that's parameterized. So this this will consume uh, a row with. You know, I don't know if it's a generic row and, uh, and it's not actually strongly typed at this level or if it's a long comma string row. Um, I'd have to f uh, find out. So it's, it's something that consumes this and then it produces as a result a task. So the value of it is a task. And so the, va uh, the, the task star is something that re returns a, a list of tasks. Now you could argue that it should be a set because well, I guess SQL, uh, a SQL select could be, uh, uh, could be ordered. So I'm a little unsure because the way we've chopped everything up, uh, whether it's worth starting the lab, you know, I think it's not because um, it's a longish lab. So what we should do is just, you know, break it here. Um, you do the lab on uh, next Monday. Um, and I guess it probably makes more sense to, to first do the exam and then the lab because otherwise it's going to be very unnerving. So we'll do the exam on Monday. Then we'll do. Then you know, I'll, I'll do a very brief refresher so that I remember where we are at, um, and then you'll do the lab. Um, the homework is also only due next week, of course, because you know, it doesn't make any sense for you to do that before the before having done the lab. So this time you finish up the homework for uh, for the previous lecture. Um, questions.